Welcome to the Swim Upstream podcast, where we talk about intentional living against cultural norms. If you're ready to break out of survival mode and cultivate a more intentional life, then you're in the right place. Find your courage to live differently and swim upstream. Let's get started. Welcome back, y'all. This is Jenny. And you are listening to episode 5, Homesteading, Intentional Living Towards Self-Sufficiency. But first, let's talk about what I'm learning this week. This week I'm learning um, about chickens. I'm learning a lot of things about the chicks that we have. And I'm learning things about how to keep up with them. Mainly, at the beginning of this week, I learned about roosters. Uh, We found out that one of our hens, Miss Wilma, was actually a roo. And um, so I needed to find a place for him to go. We do not have plans to keep roosters. Um, They don't fit into our goals with what we want to do with our hens. And so we had to find him a new home. And in finding him a new home, I found a lady local to us who also raises and breeds chickens and we were able to do a trade so we traded Wilbur the rooster for Hazel who is a black copper moran bird Um, she's very very pretty and we're very glad that we have her to add I'm also learning a lot more about feeding our chicks We have started them on some scraps from the garden. Mainly the radishes that we're picking from the garden have lots of greens on the top of them. And we've been chopping that up along with some apple and putting some grit in there. And just learning about different things that chickens can and cannot eat. Um, And just learning how best to take care of them. Which also means that we've been looking into a chicken first aid kit. Uh, There are lots of different things health-wise that can go wrong with chicks um, and with hens, but especially when you're raising chicks. And so there are certain things that you have to watch for that when they happen, you need to be ready to act quickly. So I ordered a couple things from Amazon, one of which is called VetRx, and another which is a probiotic type herbal supplement with electrolytes that you put in their water. I'll put links to both of those in the show notes just in case you're curious of how we're taking care of our chickens. But those will help us to have things we need on hand for our chicks as they get older. Okay, let's get into episode five. Homesteading, intentional living towards self-sufficiency. So before we get started, I think that what we need to do is talk more about some definitions. Y'all will excuse me if you hear me sniffling. It is allergy season and I've been outside the past two days. So you may hear me sniffle every once in a while and I apologize for that. So what is the definition of intentional living? Intentional living is when you live with purpose and with a goal in mind. You're not just flying by the seat of your pants. You're not just going with the flow. You have a destination in mind, and you're trying to reach that destination through the things that you do and the way that you live. So our goal at Swim Upstream is to live intentionally. So when I talk about intentional living with self-care, or when I talk about intentional living with homesteading and those kinds of things that's what I'm thinking in my mind I'm thinking about living with purpose with a goal in mind that you're trying to reach a mindset a vision that you have for your family and you're working towards that vision or you're making decisions based on that vision of what fits it and what doesn't so that you can build that intentional life that you're trying to find. So, what is the definition of homesteading? 
Homesteading is a lifestyle of self-sufficiency characterized by subsistence agriculture, home preservation of food, and may also involve the small-scale production of textiles, clothing, and craft work for household use or sale. Okay, those are a lot of big words and technical terms, and so let's break that down. Subsistence agriculture. So a lifestyle of self-sufficiency characterized by subsistent agriculture. So someone who is a homesteader is someone who lives a life geared toward being self-sufficient by growing all or most, almost all of the goods required by the family. That would include things like having a garden, raising chickens for eggs or meat, having goats or a cow for milk and meat. It would include things like bees, hunting and fishing, things that they're doing where those, those activities are specifically geared toward providing all or almost all of the food that their family might need. Now we are newbie homesteaders so we are not at the level that we are able to provide all that we need. However, because Michael and Gracie and Georgia hunt in deer season, we have enough deer. Our goal is at the end of the season to have enough deer to replace our red meat consumption. So typically... If we meet that goal, I'm not buying beef for the entire year. This year we were really able to meet that goal because Michael got a large buck and then Gracie got a smaller doe and the two of them together have been more than enough. We have not bought meat of any kind from the store since the week of Christmas. So um, that is one of our goals that we have already met. Chickens. We have chickens who will eventually provide us eggs, and that is their purpose on the farm. We do not want to raise chickens for meat for a lot of different reasons. One, we're limited in the space that we have for chickens, and we would rather have chickens who continue to give us eggs rather than to have a few chickens that we then butcher for meat, and then we would actually run out of that meat before the next round of birds were mature enough to butcher. So it makes sense for us to raise chickens for their eggs primarily. Um, We don't have the ability to have goats or a cow where we are. We don't have enough land for that. We are in a place where we're in rural North Carolina. We do live in a farming community But we are in a very small neighborhood that was a former cow pasture. So we have great soil. And so that makes gardening a little bit easier. Um, Our neighborhood has about 25 to 30 houses in it. And we have no HOA. Our land itself is just under three quarters of an acre. And everybody has at least that big or bigger yard. So... We have quite a lot of land to work with. We don't have very many restrictions. So it's easy for us to do the gardening and the chickens and the hunting, you know, off off the land. Um, We aren't able to hunt here, obviously, but we have land that we can hunt off of further away. And also we're going to be working towards eventually having bees. And our goals in that were, what does our family consume a lot of? And that would be eggs and honey. And so those are the two things that we're going to try to grow the most of. And we will also replace as much of our produce consumption as we can with stuff from the garden. So that explains subsistent agriculture. Um, And these farm families typically have little to no surplus Some of them are market farmers where they're growing things to sell at farmer's market, but most of them are just really trying to work towards 
providing as much of their own food supply as possible. Um, So homesteading also includes home preservation of food. This can look like a lot of different things. When people say home preservation, I think the thing that immediately jumps to mind is canning. And that can be done with water bath or with a pressure canner. I have a water bath canner that I am very comfortable with and have done lots of different things. The pressure canner I bought right before we moved a year ago and I've taken it out of the box once. And this will be the year that I learned to use it. I haven't gotten up enough nerve to actually process anything with it yet. But you can also freeze food, dehydrate, vacuum seal, freeze dry, or use a root cellar to preserve food but the idea is that you're bringing in so much from the garden that you're going to preserve to use throughout the year so that it provides most of what your family needs to eat year round okay and our definition of homesteading also includes small scale production of textiles clothing and craft work so this could be things like collecting fibers um like alpaca fleece to turn into you to spin into yarn maybe quilting goat's milk soap beeswax candles pottery if you live in an area with a lot of clay in the soil and basically they most people will begin providing a need for their own family and sometimes it may expand into a a business or a side hobby but not always Homesteaders are also usually minimalists and conscious consumers. They're not going to be excessive shoppers or people who shop for entertainment or for socialization. They're going to focus on local goods, local stores, vintage and secondhand shops, and fair trade businesses. And they're going to be focused a lot on natural materials like wood, cast iron, cotton and linen, leather or animal hide with a focus on high quality, durability and usefulness. They're going to be more apt to buy investment pieces versus impulse purchases. So now that we have a good working definition of intentional living and we have a very good understanding now of what homesteading is. The focus of this podcast is to help you think through intentional living with a goal towards homesteading, towards self-sufficiency. Our personal goal for our family is as an intentional living is to work towards homesteading. Your goal of intentional living as a family might be different from that. And we'll discuss that near the end. So why do we homestead? What made us pick this particular lifestyle to be intentional about? What made this appealing as a goal of self-sustainability? Number one, we want to be connected to the land. Connection to creation keeps me connected to the creator. I get a lot of joy out of watching things grow, out of seeing the order and the structure and the the beauty of nature and the seasons and the process of a seed that germinates, that becomes a seedling, that grows into a full plant, that produces fruit, that we eat, that we take the seeds from, that we start over. It's an amazing process to me and I love that homesteading connects us closer to that than we would be otherwise number two we also want to teach our girls about food supply and other old-fashioned homesteading skills we want our girls to appreciate where their food came from when we eat deer for dinner it's a very different experience than when we eat chicken from the supermarket Because we're talking about the time that the girls spent with their dad when they went hunting. 
we're talking about how grateful we are for the food that God provided for us through that hunt. We appreciate the quality of the meat because we can taste that it's not gamey and that it's 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 a good quality meat compared to scarfing down a hamburger. We also want to teach them how to do old-fashioned homesteading skills like mending clothing or learning how to use the materials that you have to build something, how to do things inexpensively, how how things work, how you put them together, just different life skills that really have become lost in our society. The things that used to be necessities that over the years were not passed down anymore because the parents were working or the children were gone for the day at school or things like that. So we really want to value and teach our girls a lot of those old-fashioned homemaking skills and homesteading skills. Number three, we want to aim to be more of a producer than a consumer. We want to be having things to offer, not just for our family, but for neighbors, for extended family, for friends and church family, that when there's a need, we have resources that we can pull from and provide without having to run to Target to get it. Number four reason is work ethic. Number one, we want to build a work ethic in our girls. We want them to be hard workers. We want them to value hard work. We want to have them appreciate the satisfaction of a job that's well done. We want them to choose husbands who will work hard to provide for their families. And we also want to teach the girls that there's a lot that they do that contributes to their family, even as young girls, and that their work is valuable and their work is important. It's not just busy work or things that we do to get them out of our hair, that the work that they do is valuable to our family and to our homesteading life. And I think that when they understand that, they're more able to serve joyfully they're more able to work heartily because they get pleasure and satisfaction out of a job that's well done number five reason why we want to homestead is a greater ability to sustain our own family and to help others just like i was talking about before with being a producer versus a consumer All of our homestead goals start with the ability to sustain our family and to help others. And we want to be givers. We want to be generous. And when your giving and your generosity depends on money in the bank or things that you buy at the store, it limits you a lot more. When you're able to give generously because you've worked hard to produce a bounty of a harvest, then it doesn't matter that you only spent $3 on a pack of seeds. You have an abundance from which you can give to other people. And as a caveat here, I want to say that we acknowledge as believers that God is our ultimate provider. So we do not believe in any way that by becoming homesteaders, by working towards self-sustainability, that we actually believe that we can provide for ourselves on our own through just our hard work. We are not dependent on just us to provide for us. We know that what we have comes from the Lord and we want to honor that by being very good stewards of the things that he's given us. We want to take care of those things. We want to nurture them and we want to use them well. So when he's given us gifts and talents and and a passion for his creation and a passion for the land and for the things that we grow and the things that we hunt and the way that we are working towards self-sustainability, we're doing it out of 
stewardship and gratitude to the Lord. Not because we think we can replace his provision. Okay, number six. We want to be prepared for hard times for us and for our girls. This is intentional living modeled. This is when they understand why we're working towards being self-sustaining. There are many groups that I'm in on Facebook who are people who stock food, people who are home canners and preservers, people who grow large gardens and basically live a homesteading lifestyle who over and over again, the overarching theme of of a lot of posts since COVID-19 has come about has been, finally, I am validated. People don't think I'm crazy now. Now they understand why I stock this food, why I can all these fruits and vegetables, why I grow such a big garden, why I do the things that I do. When you're prepared, there's no chaos. There's no panic when chaos comes you're ready for it um probably two weeks before everything shut down it was my weekly time to go to the grocery store there was already talk of washing your hands more often but there was no talk at all of shutting anything down or slowing life down and I looked at my pantry and I determined where I had gaps and where things were low and I thought about, okay, if this is the one time I go to the grocery store this month, what do I need to buy? And I stocked up. And I got a lot of funny looks. I even got some funny looks from my family thinking, aren't you taking this a little far? Do you really think this is going to be that big of a deal? And it turned out that it was that big of a deal. And I was really grateful that we were prepared because it's really minimized um, the amount that we've had to go out and purchase things and again when we're prepared for hard times and we're not struggling and focused on getting everything that we need then we're freed up and positioned to be able to help other people who may not be prepared so maybe because we bought extra canned beans we have beans to donate to the food pantry Maybe because we looked ahead and we planted seeds back in January or February, we now have seedlings for our garden that we can give to other people to grow in their garden. Maybe because we thought ahead and we planted way more than we needed, we'll have an abundance of produce that we can share with other people. So being prepared for hard times. Number seven, is our one reason that we don't homestead for. We don't homestead to save money or time. Homesteading is not cheap. Homesteading is a privilege. It is not something that everyone can afford to do. And we are so grateful that we are in a position that we are able to. It is not a money-saving endeavor by any means. Yes, you are pulling produce and groceries from your own backyard. You're getting eggs every morning from your own backyard. But the time and money that goes into the chickens and the coop that they live in and the run that they um, inhabit, the time and money that it took to buy seed or plants and soil and soil amendments and put all those things in the ground and support things with trellises and things like that there's a lot of money that goes into that and yes there's a blessing and there's produce and surplus after that but there's a lot of investment that's made both in your time and in your money so homesteading is not an easy life to choose it's it's actually a life that requires more of you it requires more work it requires more time it requires more money and sometimes it's good to remind us 
and remind our girls that we don't just do everything because it's quicker or easier or cheaper. Sometimes you choose the harder, longer way. And sometimes we can choose to do hard things because it's the better thing for our family and for our intentional living. So, if this appeals to you at all, and you're sitting at home right now, what are things that you can do even in the middle of COVID-19? What are some things you can do right now to begin homesteading right where you are? Whether that's a house in the country or whether that's an apartment in the city, what could you do? First of all, you can grow some food. Next week, we're going to talk all about different ways that we can garden, different options that we have, things to think about in terms of growing our own food. And I'm sure there's probably some ways that you could be growing food that you haven't even thought about, really. So beginning to close the loop on the food supply chain and make that chain smaller where you can see where your food came from. Growing your own food is really a big step in homesteading. Even if it's not all the food that you're going to need. Growing a few tomatoes on your patio. Putting a row of radishes on the side of your flower bed. Simple little things like that that you can do that just add to your food consumption in your home by producing some of it yourself. Um, Another thing you can do to begin homesteading right where you are is reduce your possessions. Like I said, homesteading people primarily are minimalists and most often the reason for that is because they don't have time to fool with things in their house. (laughs) They don't have time to deal with clutter or dust a bunch of knickknacks and things like that. Their home life itself is very simple so that they have the time and the energy that they need to focus on maintaining their land and their garden and their animals and the things that they're doing around the farm because those things will keep them very busy. So reduce your possessions. Number three, rethink your spending. If you are a consumer more than a producer, if you shop for socializing time or for entertainment, if you are dying because you can't get into Target right now, rethink your spending habits and think about how you can buy local, how you can buy secondhand, how you can buy fair trade, how you can buy things that are long lasting investments versus impulse purchasing. So grow some food, reduce your possessions, rethink your spending. And last but not least, learn a skill that makes you more self-sufficient. Maybe you want to learn how to mend your clothes. There are lots of neat little tricks for mending a hole in a pair of socks or patching a shirt that has a hole, learning to sew buttons, learning to hem your pants, different things to mend or repair things that are broken, whether it's clothing or maybe it's home appliances or whatever it is. Maybe it's large appliances. Being able to fix things and keep them maintained rather than just chucking them in the trash and buying a new one. What about baking bread or cooking from scratch? What about preserving food? Even if it's not food that you've grown, you can still learn how to preserve food through any of the ways that we talked about canning or dehydrating or or freezing any of those kinds of things maybe you want to learn 
how to care for backyard chickens. I'll put some links in the show notes for basics of backyard chickens. For those of you who are curious, there is a huge surge of people keeping chicks in their backyard right now so that they will have eggs as a supply because deep down they want to make sure that they have an open food supply chain. Um, And then last but not least, stock your pantry. You may wonder well how do you stock up enough food that you don't have to go buy meat for four months how did you do that what what do you have in your pantry that means that you don't have to go to the grocery store very often how do how do you get to that point that will be in episode seven so next time we'll talk more about growing food and then in episode seven we'll talk more about stocking food so that you can be prepared when something like a shutdown from a virus or a hurricane comes through or maybe you're without power for several days. There are lots of reasons why it's a good idea to be prepared and have a stocked pantry. So our action step for this week, what does intentional living look like for you? And when I ask you that question, I want you to think about what's right for you. Not how can you start homesteading so that you're more like me. But what works for you and your family? What is the goal that you want to be striving for? What do you want the ultimate purpose of your family to be? And what can you begin to work towards that could make that a reality? Go through the steps of change that we talked about in episode two. Go through and ask your why. Research. Decide on an action step. And don't worry about what other people think of it. But see if you can figure out what is the main intention of my family. Where are we going? What are we trying to accomplish? You may discover that you don't even have one right now, but you'd like to have one. And it'd be a great conversation around the dinner table or with your spouse or with your roommate or your partner or whoever it is that you share your life with. What do I want my life to look like? And what do I need to do to help me start getting there? You've been listening to the Swim Upstream podcast, where each week we discuss intentional living against cultural norms. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review of iTunes. This helps me be seen and heard by more potential listeners. I'd also really appreciate it if you would share this episode with a friend who might enjoy it as much as you did. As always, we can continue our conversation on Instagram at swim.upstream or on Facebook at Jenny Veliki. You can find the links to both of those in the show notes. And remember, the life you live is built on the choices you make. So just keep swimming.